This episode of The History Guy is brought to you by the free-to-play online strategy game, Supremacy 1914. In the spring of 1918, the German army launched a massive assault on British lines in the area of the Somme, and after four years of war, the entire cause of the Western Allies was thrown into jeopardy. Standing in their way were the exhausted men of the 16th Irish and 36th Ulster Divisions. In a defense that has been both much maligned and largely forgotten, the men of the Irish Division fought a desperate battle that deserves to be remembered. The German Spring Offensive was one of the largest battles of one of the largest wars in human history, and you can reenact the strategies of that war in the exciting, free-to-play, Player vs. Player online strategy game, Supremacy 1914. In Supremacy 1914, you get to choose a real country to lead against up to 500 other players in real-time games that take up to weeks to complete. You build your army from different types of units, cavalry, tanks, planes, even battleships. You forge alliances with other players and choose your strategy to achieve ultimate victory. I've played dozens of games of Supremacy 1914, and I really enjoy that each game map and country you play offers different challenges, and you can play on the same account with both PC and mobile. And if you act fast, you can get an exclusive gift. Click on the link in the description, and you'll get 15,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. The offer is only available for 30 days, so act fast, and I'll see you on the battlefield. The spring offensives of 1918 were driven by two events that radically shifted the situation in the Great War. The entry of the U.S. as a major belligerent and the exit of Russia. The online international encyclopedia of the First World War explains. General Erich Ludendorff, the first quartermaster general and de facto commander of the German army, began to consider a renewed offensive on the Western Front in October 1917. The Reich's strategic situation informed his deliberations. The USA had been an enemy since April and was trending a huge army across the Atlantic. Russia's revolution and collapsing war effort had freed up German units in the east. 48 divisions could be transferred to the Western Front, increasing German strength to 191 against 178 Allied divisions by the spring of 1918. The general thus had one final brief chance to win a decisive victory there before the arrival of overwhelming American forces. Early on, Ludendorff decided to focus his plan on the British. Warfare History Network explains, Ludendorff already had fixed his mind that the spring offensive would fall on the British. In the months that followed, the German high command weighed different options, including an attack on the French, but Ludendorff had no intention of focusing on the French. We must beat the British, he said. Ludendorff justified this on the grounds that the British would be more likely to sign an armistice than the French, given that they were not fighting on their own soil. And the British Army, which Ludendorff thought had been exhausted in offensives in 1917, was particularly vulnerable. Warfare History Network continues. British Prime Minister David Lloyd George had become disturbed at the acceptance of high casualties over the two previous years of fighting by the commander of British and Commonwealth troops, Field Marshal Sir Douglas Haig. For this reason, Lloyd George had taken steps to reduce Haig's control and influence. And one of the ways that he did this was to curtail the number of British and Commonwealth reinforcements sent to the Western Front. Squadron leader Phil Clare wrote on the website of the Royal Air Force's Center for Strategic and Conceptual Thinking on Air, Space, and Cyber Power in 2018. This reduction in fighting manpower was compounded by the fact that in February 1918, the BEF was directed to take over an additional 20 miles of the front line previously held by the French. By spring 1918, Germany could field 192 divisions in the West, the French and British only 156. Of course, Haig and the British Expeditionary Force anticipated a German spring offensive. Claire writes that, in assessing his defensive positions, Haig placed most of his forces to the north of Arras, stretching to Flanders and Ypres, thereby protecting the vital channel ports that were the BEF's lifeline. But that left a weaker defense to the south, defended by the British Fifth Army under the command of General Sir Hubert Goh. Claire continues, Looking further south, Haig knew that Goh's 5th Army lacked the strength to hold the line around St. Quentin, but the ground that lay behind the front line would allow commanders in this area to conduct a controlled retreat before the Germans reached any significant objective. It is possible that the BEF's own self-belief may have been laced with a degree of hubris. Their view that the British Army could withstand the German attack would be tested to destruction along the 5th Army's front. Included in Goh's 5th Army were two divisions that both had things in common, but yet were also 
very different. The 36th Ulster Division had been formed in September 1914, largely from members of the Ulster Volunteer Force. The Ulster Volunteers were a unionist militia or paramilitary organization formed in 1912 to train for armed opposition to Irish home rule. The issue of Irish home rule had failed several times in Parliament, but political shifts meant that a passage of Home Rule Act became a distinct possibility. While home rule was popular throughout most of the mostly Catholic population of Ireland, the northeast province of Ulster included many Irish Protestants who wished to maintain both local independence and their connection to the United Kingdom. The Ulster Volunteers, with the full support of the United Kingdom's Conservative Party, raised and drilled a force intended to battle, if necessary, with the British Army. Thus the irony at the outbreak of war, an event that stalled the implementation of home rule, that the Ulster Volunteers offered their service to the Crown in the war in Europe. The website Researching Soldiers of the British Army in the Great War explains, On 3 September 1914, just short of a month after Britain had declared war and after much discussion regarding what amounted to a political truce with regard to domestic matters, Sir Edward Carson, one of the great political leaders opposing home rule for Ireland, made an appeal at the meeting of the Ulster Unionist Council in Belfast, urging the men of the Ulster Volunteer Force to come forward for service in the defense of the British Empire. The first Herbert Kitchener, Secretary of State for War, who was responsible for raising the largest volunteer army in British history, did not want to raise a division tied to Ulster, afraid of the political implications. But when recruiting in Ireland was falling short of goals, he had little choice. The 36th Ulster Division arrived in France in October 1915. The division distinguished itself during the 1916 Battle of the Somme. The website of the Somme Association describes their role on the first day of the battle. Leaving their trenches early and before the bombardment had moved on, the battalions caught the Germans in their bunkers and made progress as far as the German third line, the farthest advances of the day. However, the divisions attacking on their flanks had been quickly repulsed, and the German machine guns now turned on the Ulster men who were caught in enfilade fire from the side and from behind, causing great slaughter. Over the two days of the battle, the division lost some 5,500 killed, wounded, or missing, and of these, around 2,500 had been killed. The website notes that with the local village recruitment of the Ulster volunteers, the losses had a devastating effect back in Ireland. Their performance surpassing almost all other units to achieve their objective on the first day of the battle was a matter of great pride. Memorial Tower in the city of Thiepville commemorates their contribution to the battle in which four members of the 36th were awarded Victoria Crosses. But recruitment was difficult and the battalion was unable to make good the losses of the Somme and constant fighting. Author Pauline Mitchell noted in a 2014 edition of the journal History Ireland that the commanding general, Major General Sir Oliver Stuart Wood Nugent, suggested the politically unthinkable, amalgamating the reduced 36th Division with the other serving Irish division, the 16th Irish Division. Author Terence Denman wrote in his 2014 book, Ireland's Unknown Soldiers, the 16th Irish Division in the Great War, 1914-1918, the formation of the Ulster Volunteer Force provoked the organization of a rival armed nationalist organization, the Irish Volunteers. Facing a recruiting crisis and growing need to grow an army that was by continental standards small, Kitchener had little choice but to seek the assistance of the leaders of the Irish Volunteers in recruiting another Irish division. Thus, these two volunteer forces, intended to fight each other, went to France to fight a common enemy. Denman notes, it is one of the paradoxes of the Great War that its coming, whatever carnage it released in Europe, prevented the outbreak of a bloody civil war in Ireland. The 16th Irish Division went to France in December 1915. Their service on the Western Front earned them the reputation as a first-class division, but like the 36th, they took enormous losses in the more than four-month battle of the Somme. As conscription was a thorny issue in Ireland, the 16th could not make good their losses either. While General Nugent's idea of amalgamating the two divisions was not accepted, still an almost unthinkable attachment occurred. The website of the Somme Association explains, The 36th Ulster Division was withdrawn from the battle on 2nd July, 1916, deployed to a quiet sector opposite Messines Ridge in Flanders. They were joined there in September by the 16th Irish Division after their similar devastating losses. The division spent a year together in the line, visiting each other's messes and playing sport against each other. It was said that, had the war ended at that point and the soldiers returned to Ireland, the future history of Ireland would have been very different. 
understrength and exhausted from years in the lines, both divisions would sit directly in the path of the first phase of the massive German spring offensive. Author Mark Phelan writes in a 2018 edition of History Ireland, the Germans enjoyed a 7-to-1 manpower advantage in the pending combat zone, the larger part of which was manned by General Hubert Goh's battered 5th Army. The forces included the 16th Irish Division, with its core of nationalist volunteers, and the predominantly loyalist 36th Ulster Division, both of which lined up directly opposite the pending German steamroller. Denman writes about the condition of the 16th at the time. The division was desperately in need of rest and training. Since arriving in France in December of 1915, the division had spent only three weeks in July 1917 out of the line. The Irish Times noted in 2018, Captain Charles Miller of the 36th Ulster Division calculated that they had one man for 15 yards of front against an enemy they knew to be massing in force. Everyone knew by then that in all probability, we were in for a bad time, he said. Phelan writes that Goh's army was using a strategy called elastic defense. Each divisional front incorporated a forward battle and rear zone. He writes, Theoretically, the forward zone consisted of supporting redoubts manned by a handful of companies, which would disrupt the German onslaught before falling back in good order upon the battle zone. Here, several kilometers behind the front line, the bulk of the defenders would be ready to repulse the suitably bloody German assault troops, while reserves held back in the rear would deal with any breakthroughs. The German assault, called Operation Michael, began on March 21st with a massive five-hour artillery barrage that expended some 1.16 million shells. But Phelan writes, weather conditions accentuated the impact of the shell fire. A heavy fog that one of the officers described as a gray-white darkness, the consistency of steam, saying that it was a fog, not a mist, meant that the forward positions were quickly bypassed by the dreaded German stormtroopers. Phelan writes that the fog greatly hampered exposed units such as the 16th Irish Division, which relied on accurate machine gun fire to protect the scattered outposts near the front line. Many of the outposts were quickly swamped. Still, he writes, despite these disadvantages, the 16th Irish Division fought fiercely. The understrength 16th Division was faced by six German divisions. While the division held in many places, others fell beneath the bombardment and the fog. Denman notes that the battalion command of the 7th 8th Inskillings was rapidly enveloped. The CO was wounded and captured, his second in command taken prisoner, the adjutant killed, the intelligence officer wounded, the signals officer killed. Coordinated resistance was impossible. In the desperate fighting, the 16th Division suffered over 7,000 casualties. Denman noted the 16th Division had suffered such losses on the 21st that it ceased in anything but name to be a division. One of the officers wrote in his diary, The division has ceased to exist. Wiped off the map. Then writes that in fighting so determinedly, the 16th Irish essentially sacrificed itself on behalf of the wider 5th Army. Likewise, many of the 36th Ulster Division's forward outposts were overrun quickly, but there were notable exceptions, including a standby C Company of the 12th Irish Rifles, holding a position called Racehorse Redoubt, where 2nd Lieutenant Edmund de Wind held his ground for seven hours. Though twice wounded and practically single-handed, he continued to repel attack after attack until he was mortally wounded and collapsed. He was posthumously awarded the Victoria Cross. Despite enormous losses, Phelan writes the survivors still played a critical role in covering the retreat. Michael Nugent, manager of World War I Research Ireland, noted in 2019, The 1st Battalion of the Royal Inskling Fusiliers on March 22nd fought to the last man against the German Prussian Guard Divisions, who were the elite of the German army. And on March 24th, the 2nd Battalion of the Royal Irish Rifles fought until they had no ammunition left, then fixed bayonets and charged the Germans. They had 96 men killed. During the two weeks of Operation Michael, the division sustained 7,310 casualties. The Irish Times wrote that the first day of the German spring offensives, with the exception of the first day of the Battle of the Somme, was the worst day of the war for the British. Yet despite advancing nearly 40 miles, Operation Michael failed to achieve the required decisive victory. Turns out that much of the land that they had overrun was of little value and that the German losses were unrecoverable. The spring offensives were at best a Pyrrhic victory that hastened the Germans' defeat. The two Irish divisions fought nearly to destruction side by side in the German spring offensive, something that seems ironic given their differing positions on Irish independence. George Boyd, a professor of political theory at University College Swansea, said that the, the Irish Catholic soldier answered the call of faith and fatherland and king 
and country. So too did the Ulster Protestant soldier. But neither could be sure that these two would, in the end, be compatible loyalties. Supremacy 1914 is an exciting free online strategy player versus player game set during World War I, where you can choose your strategy, engage in epic battles, and take over the world. Claim your exclusive gift of 15,000 gold and a one month free premium subscription by clicking on the link in the description. The offer is only good for 30 days, so act fast. Click the link in the description, choose your country, and fight your way to victory. I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of The History Guy. And if you did, please feel free to like and subscribe and share The History Guy with your friends. And if you also believe that history deserves to be remembered, then you can support The History Guy as a member on YouTube, a supporter on our community and locals, or as a patron on Patreon. You can also check out our great merchandise shop for book a special message from The History Guy on Cameo.